Chapter 12 Delusions of Grandeur Will you succumb to his witchcraft with your eyes open? These are merely medleys of muddled dreams. Allah's house was tainted with the lingering effects of the satanic verses, so Muhammad needed a new quibla, a new direction to go, a new object to exploit. He needed to replace the Kaaba with a more credible shrine. So the wannabe prophet conjured up one of the most preposterous lies ever uttered in the name of religion. He said that he was flown on a winged steed to the temple in Jerusalem. There he was welcomed triumphantly by all the former scriptural big shots. They were there waiting for him, assembled in a solemn conclave of prophet solidarity. His imagination running wild, Muhammad leapt from the temple mount skyward, ascending from one heaven to another, finding himself in the presence of Allah, who promptly dismissed him, demanding that Muslims moon him fifty times a day. Hallucination over, Muhammad awoke the following morning in the house of his late uncle Talib. The vision still dancing vividly before his eyes, he cried out to his niece, Om Hani, during the night I prayed in the temple of Jerusalem. She begged him not to expose such frivolity to the Karish, but he persisted anyway. Um, Abu Talib's daughter, said, The apostle went on no journey except while he was in my house. He slept in my home that night after he prayed the final night prayer. A little before dawn he woke us, saying, Oh, Um, I went to Jerusalem. He got up to go out, and I grabbed hold of his robe and laid bare his belly. I pleaded, Oh, Muhammad, do not tell the people about this, for they will know you are lying and will mock you. He said, By Allah, I will tell them. I told a negress slave of mine, Follow him and listen. As the story spread, Muhammad's fledgling cadre of followers abandoned him. The disillusionment was confirmed by Khatib al-Wadiki. Upon hearing this, many became renegades who had prayed and joined Islam. The Sirah says, Nishak. Many Muslims gave up their faith. Some went to Abu Bakr and said, What do you think of your friend now? He alleges that he went to Jerusalem last night and prayed there and came back to Mecca. Bakr said that they were lying about the apostle. But they told him that he was in the mosque at this very moment, telling the Quraysh about it. Bakr said, If he says so, then it must be true. I believe him. That is more extraordinary than his story at which you boggle. Then Allah sent down a Quran surah concerning those who left Islam for this reason. We made the vision which we showed you only a test for men. We put them in fear, but it only adds to their heinous error. This became Quran 1333. Once again, Muhammad flips out, and it's everybody else's fault but his own. And while it's not surprising anymore, the 13th surah was handed down in Medina, not Mecca. What's surprising is that the Thunder Surah actually rebukes Muhammad's claim of a miraculous journey. After saying, Quran 13, verse 5, Those who deny will wear collars and chains, yokes of servitude tying their hands to their necks, and they will be the inmates of hell. They will witness our many exemplary punishments. Verily, your Lord is severe in retribution. We are told that Muhammad was unable to perform a miracle. Quran 13.7 The unbelievers say, Why was no sign or miracle sent down to him by his Lord? But you are only the bearer of bad news, of warnings. The admission is repeated. Verse 27 The unbelievers say, How is it that no sign miracle was sent down to him by his Lord? Say, God leads whoever he wills astray. There were deceptions, but there were no miracles. The Islamic God was not only powerless, he was schizophrenic. Quran 13.30 They do not believe in our Rahman. Tell them, He is my Lord. There is no other Illah but He. In Him I have placed my trust. The Dark Lord says to those who are mocking His Prophet. Quran 13.32 Many an apostle they have mocked before you, but I seized them. How awful was my punishment then! The unbelievers plot, but for them is torment in this life and a far more severe torture in hell. Then the spirit of the Quran brags, 
He sends thunderbolts and smites whom he pleases. Imagine worshipping a god this nasty. Suggesting that he wasn't always impotent, a rockman boasts. Quran 13.38 It was not for any apostle to come up with a miracle or sign unless it was granted by our permission. But he was capricious and forgetful. For every age there is a book revealed. Arachman abrogates, blocks out, or confirms whatever he wants. And we'd better watch out. Quran 13.41 Do they not see us advancing from all sides into the land of disbelievers, reducing its borders by giving it to believers in war victories? When Allah dooms, there is none who can postpone his doom. Surely they devised their plots, but we are the best schemers. But his Khan didn't fool very many. Quran 13.43 Yet the disbelievers say, You are not a messenger. Tell them, This scripture is sufficient witness between me and you. Now that we know that there were no miracles, and that these troubled words are the lone witness to the validity of Muhammad's claims, let's try to make sense of his fictitious journey. As always, it will be difficult to tell where the Prophet's imagination subsided and that of the Muslim sages began. For example, when questioned by the Quraysh, we are told that the angelless and miracleless messenger convinced his spirit friend to erect a model of Jerusalem in their midst. As further evidence of the night's journey, Muhammad said that while whizzing over a caravan, the noise of his flying steed frightened a camel to death. Upon returning to Mecca, someone is said to have confirmed that a camel had indeed been anxious. It served as proof. The only other Quranic mention of the flight of fancy is found in the 17th surah. It opens with, Glory to him who carried away his votary by night from the sacred mosque at Mecca, to the farther temple, the environs which we have blessed, that we might show him some of our signs. Verily, he hears and sees. The six-year-old Aisha, who married the fifty-year-old prophet within days of Khadijah's death, said, Ishaq, the prophet's body remained where it was. Allah removed his spirit at night. And that there was no way to see Jerusalem at night in the seventh century, the cover of darkness must have suited Islam's demonic spirit. Aisha further indicted her husband's tale with, Bukhari, Once the prophet was bewitched so that he began to imagine that he had done a thing which, in fact, he had not done. Finishing the job, she said, Whoever claimed that Muhammad saw his Lord is committing a great fault, for he only saw Gabriel. While Aisha's criticism is incriminating, there was a bigger problem. There was no temple in Jerusalem. Six centuries before Al-Barak took flight, the Romans destroyed it. By 70 A.D., not one stone stood upon another, and that would make both the Islamic God and his prophet liars. Bukhari, O Allah's apostle, which mosque was first built on the surface of the earth? He said, The Mosque Haram in Mecca. Which was built next? He replied, The Mosque of Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. What was the period of construction between the two? He said, Forty years. No matter how one goes about interpreting these facts and fantasies, Muhammad lied. If the Kaaba was built by Allah, it was several billion years old. If by Adam, then the year was 4000 B.C. If by Abraham, it was 2000 B.C. If historical evidence is our guide, the year was around 500 A.D. The Temple of Solomon was built in 967 B.C precisely 1,000 years before Christ's crucifixion and resurrection in 33. The Dome of the Rock was raised on the foundations of the Roman Temple of Jupiter in 691 A.D. As for the mosque, Alaska was constructed over a Roman basilica on the southern end of the Temple Mount many centuries later. Muhammad got the order wrong, as well as the gap separating them. Not a psychiatrist. This story sounds delusional. Bukhari The prophet said, while I was sitting at the house or standing place in a state midway between sleep and wakefulness, an angel recognized me as the man lying between the two men. That certainly sounds provocative. A golden tray full of wisdom and belief was brought to me, and my body was cut open from the throat to the lower part of my pubic area. The prophet said, my abdomen was washed with zamzam water, taking away doubt or polytheism or pre-Islamic beliefs or error. 
Then he took out my heart and filled it with belief and wisdom before returning it to its place. Then Al Barak, a white animal smaller than a mule and bigger than a donkey, was brought to me, and I set out with Gabriel. The prophet said, The animal's step was so wide it reached the farthest point within the reach of the animal's sight. From the Sirah we read, Eshach, while I was in the Hijr, Gabriel came and stirred me with his foot. He took me to the door of the mosque, and there was a white animal, half mule, half donkey, with wings on its sides, yet it was propelled by its feet. He mounted me on it. When I mounted, he shied. Gabriel placed his hand on its mane and said, To the jackass, You should be ashamed to behave this way. By God, you have never had a more honorable rider than Muhammad. The animal was so embarrassed, it broke into a cold sweat. In a hadith from a Muslim's collection, Muhammad dispenses with the surgery and adds two ritual prayers in the temple, along with a refreshing drink. Muslim, the messenger said, I was brought on al Burak, an animal white and long. I mounted it and came to the temple in Jerusalem. I tethered it to the ring used by the prophets and entered the mosque, praying two rakas in it. Then I came out of the non-existent building, and Gabriel brought me a vessel of wine and one of milk. I chose the milk, and he said, You have chosen the natural thing, and took me to heaven. Ishak, when we arrived at the temple in Jerusalem, we found Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, along with a company of prophets. I acted as their imam in prayer. In case you're curious, Moses was a ruddy-faced man, thinly fleshed, curly-haired, with a hooked nose. Jesus was a reddish man with lank, wet hair and many freckles. After the completion of my business in Jerusalem, a ladder was brought to me, finer than any I have ever seen. Mind you, since there was no wood in Mecca, he had never seen a ladder. An angel was in charge of it, and under his command were twelve thousand angels, each of them having twelve thousand angels under his command. Imagine that, a hundred and forty-four million angels holding a ladder. And none knows the armies of Allah better than he. Knowing Muhammad, what do you suppose he asked as he first? If you guessed hell, you win. Ishak, Muhammad said, Order Malik to show me hell. Certainly, O Malik, show Muhammad hell. Thereupon he removed its covering, and the flames blazed high into the air until I thought that they would consume everything. In Islam, wrong is right, down is up, hell is where Allah lives. Bukhari and Muslim converge at this point, and we learn that hell is in the nearest heaven. When I reached the nearest heaven, Gabriel said to heaven's gatekeeper, Open the gate. The guard asked, Who is it? He said, Gabriel. The gatekeeper said, Who is accompanying you? Gabriel said, Muhammad. The guard replied, Has he been called? Gabriel said, Yes. Then it was said, He is welcomed. What a wonderful visit his is. Then I met Adam and greeted him and said, You are welcomed, O son and prophet. Gabriel said, These parties on his right and on his left are the souls of his descendants. Those of him on his right are the companions of paradise, and the parties which are on his left are the inmates of hell. So when Adam looked toward his right side, he laughed, and when he looked left, he wept. Eshak gets a little graphic at this point. Adam reviewed the spirits of his offspring. The infidels excited his disgust. Then I saw men with lips like camels. In their hands were pieces of fire like stones, which they thrust into their mouths. They came out their posteriors. Before I tell you who deserved this fate, think about the folks who irked Muhammad the most. Who wouldn't share what he coveted? Who neglected him, allowing him to be abused? I was told they sinfully devoured the wealth of orphans. Others had bellies like camels. Some were maddened by thirst. Then I saw women hanging by their breasts. They had fathered bastards. But not all was hellish. Speaking of the son whose wife he would steal in an act of incest, the prophet said, 
Ishak. He took me into paradise, and there I saw a damsel with dark red lips. I asked her to whom she belonged, for she pleased me much when I saw her. She said, Zayed, Mohammed's adopted son. The apostle gave Zayed the good news about her. She was his consolation prize, I suppose. Returning to Muslim and Bukhari. Then we ascended to the second heaven. The guard at the gate asked, Who is it? Gabriel said, Gabriel. The gatekeeper asked, Who is with you? He said, Muhammad. Has he been sent for? Yes. Then the guard said, He is welcomed. What a wonderful visit his is. And opened the gate. Then I met Jesus and Yaha, who said, You are welcome, O brother and pious prophet. Rising above Jesus, we ascended to the third heaven. The keeper of the gate asked, Who is it? Gabriel. The gatekeeper asked, Who is with you? Muhammad. Has he been sent for? Yes. He is welcomed, and what a wonderful visit his is. He opened the gate. The prophet added, There I met Joseph and greeted him. He replied, You are welcomed, brother and prophet. We ascended to the fourth heaven, and again the same questions and answers were exchanged with the gatekeeper. There I met Idris, who is Enoch. He said, Welcome, prophet. We ascended to the fifth heaven, and again the same questions and answers were exchanged at the gate with its guard. There I greeted Aaron. The Islamic heaven is filled with Jews, and it has more gates and guards than do most prisons. I wonder if that's a coincidence. Whatever the reason, they were all flung open for the great Arab prophet. Then we ascended to the sixth heaven, and again the same questions and answers were exchanged. There I met and greeted Moses. When I proceeded on, he started weeping, and on being asked why, he said, Followers of this youth who was sent after me will enter paradise in greater numbers than my followers. This passage provides a glimpse into Muhammad's corroded heart. In an effort to elevate himself, he had the audacity to claim that Moses was jealous of him. Leaving Jewish prophets in the dust, our dynamic duo scampered ever higher. We ascended to the seventh heaven, and again the same questions and answers were exchanged with the gatekeeper. There I greeted Abraham. He ascended with me till I was taken to such a height I heard the scraping of pens. I was shown al Bait al-Mamur, Allah's house. I asked Gabriel about it, and he said, This is where seventy thousand angels perform prayers daily, and when they leave they never return to it. A fresh batch arrives daily. I was shown Sidrat al-Muntaha, a tree, and I saw its nabak fruits which resembled clay jugs. Its leaves were like elephant ears. Four rivers originated at its root. I asked Gabriel about them. The two hidden rivers are in paradise, and the apparent ones are the Euphrates and the Nile. At least he had the last part right. He was in a state of denial. Fifty prayers were enjoined on me. By Allah. But Moses wasn't pleased. I descended until I reached Moses, who asked, What have you done? I asked, I have been ordered to offer fifty prayers a day. He said, your followers cannot bear fifty prostrations. I tested your people before you, and tried my level best to bring the tribe of Israel to obedience. That would be Islam. Your followers cannot put up with such an obligation, so return to your Lord and request a reduction in the burden. I returned and requested Allah for reduction, and he made it forty. I had a similar discussion with Moses. Then I returned to Allah for a reduction, and he made it thirty then twenty, then ten. Then I came to Moses, who repeated the same advice. Ultimately, Allah reduced it to five. When I came to Moses the last time, he said, What have you done? I said, Allah has made it five only. He repeated the same advice, but I said that I had requested so many times I felt ashamed and surrendered to Allah's final offer. When I left, I heard a voice saying, I have passed my order and have lessened the burden on my worshippers. You're brought before the creator of the universe, and all you talk about is how many times a day he wants to be mooned with burdensome and obligatory, mind-numbing, ritualistic prostrations. I don't think so. But then again, thinking is why I'm not a Muslim. 
So while we're on the subject, let's think about this. Why would Islam's lone prophet leave Allah's Kaaba in Mecca and fly to Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem to get to heaven? In all of Muhammad's flights of fancy, there are few more troubling questions than this one. Muhammad's Muslims were curious, albeit about minutia. They wanted to know what the heavenly host looked like. Bukhari Allah's apostle said, On the night of my ascension to heaven I saw Moses, who was a thin person, looking like one of the men of the tribe of Shanua. Then I saw Jesus with a red face, as if he had just come out of the bathroom. I swear, I'm not making this stuff up. And I resemble Abraham more than any of his offspring. And it's okay to scour the Bible for stories, because... Bukhari. The messenger said... Convey my teachings to the people, even if it were a single sentence, and tell the others stories of Israel which have been taught to you, for it is not sinful to do so, and whoever tells a lie on me intentionally will surely take his place in the hell fire. It bears mention that the night's journey is far more than an obscure theological story to Muslims. I personally met with members of Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Islamic Jihad and Oscar Martyrs Brigade in Bethlehem in December of 2001. They told me in all seriousness that the night's journey was the basis for the Islamic claim to Jerusalem. What's more, they were willing to kill and die to take it back in the name of their prophet. Back in Mecca and ever in character, the bruised messenger did what all insecure people do. He projected his morbid self-delusion upon his critics. As he had with the satanic verses, he had his God say that the night's journey was a trial. Bukhari, we granted the vision of the ascension to the heaven, mirage, which we showed you as an actual eye witness, but as a trial for people. This became Quran 1760. Allah's apostle actually saw with his own eyes the vision of all the things which were shown to him on the night journey to Jerusalem. It was not a dream. The 17th surah named Children of Israel reports Quran 17 verse 60 Your Lord circumscribes mankind and he showed you the vision of the accursed tree of the Quran. This would be Zakum, the torture tree of hell. It was a bone of contention for me, a trial for them. Thus do we instill fear and make them afraid. The surah claims, Verily, we gave Moses the Torah, and to David we gave the book of Psalms. Speaking of Jews, he says, Quran 17.7, We shall rouse our slaves to shame and ravage you, disfiguring your faces. They will enter the temple as before and destroy, laying to waste all that they conquer. To his shame, Muhammad did rouse Meccans to attack Jews. However, his militants couldn't have injured or destroyed what the Romans had eradicated 600 years earlier. Allah is mistaken again. But by lying to us in this way, we have come to know him better. The most laughable passage in the 17th surah follows the usual rant. Dread his punishment. Indeed, the Lord's torment is to be feared. He will inflict severe anguish. Nothing stops us from sending signs and proofs, except that earlier people rejected them as lies. We sent to Thamud the she-camel as a clear sign, but they treated her cruelly. It's hard to imagine anyone believes this is scripture. The Islamic God just said, We don't do miracles anymore because the Thamud hurt our camel. After saying the Quran was so well written, jinn and men couldn't conspire to compose the likes of it, we discover that Muhammad doesn't measure up, and there is no Quran. Quran 17, verse 90. They say, We shall not believe you, Muhammad, until you cause a spring to gush forth from the earth, like Moses, or until you have a garden and cause rivers to flow in their midst, like you claim Allah does in paradise. Or you cause the sky to fall on us in chunks, as you say will happen. Like Yahweh did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Or you bring angels before us face to face. Like Abraham did. Or you have a house adorned with gold. Like David or Solomon. Or you ascend up into the skies. Like Jesus of Nazareth. 
No, we shall not have any faith in you until you send down to us a book that we can read. Like the Bible. This surah was the 70th chronologically, and yet the Meccans claimed Muhammad didn't have anything to read. There was no Quran. There were no miracles. Following the night's journey, the Prophet had a new quibla to replace the one he had spoiled. So all he needed now was some followers. But having disgraced himself in Mecca with the satanic bargain, the Taif stoning, and the wild Barak ride, he needed a new audience. Fortunately, opportunity sprung up from the most unexpected place. The pilgrimage fairs promoted by Kusay were still in full swing. Tabari, the messenger used to appear at the times of the pilgrimage before the Arab tribes, summoning them to Allah, informing them that he was the prophet sent by Allah, and asking them to believe his words and defend him. I am Allah's messenger to you, commanding you to worship Allah and not to associate anything with him. Like I just did. To cast off whatever idols you worship other than him, to believe in me and the truth of my message, and to defend me so that I may make manifest the message of Allah I have been sent to convey. This was all about me, myself, and I. Insecure people like Muhammad have an insatiable craving for praise. They live to be in control, and they will stop at nothing to achieve their agenda, rationalizing everything they do along the way. When the Prophet completed his speech and appeal, Abdaluza Lahab would say, Manu so-and-so, this man is calling upon you to cast off Alat and Aluza and accept the error of his ways. Do not obey him. Do not listen to him. The Muslim sages felt that it was in their interest to demean Uncle Abu by calling him slave to al Abu. But it was a two-edged sword. For if al and Alat were pagan goddesses for which men were named, Allah was also a pre-Islamic idol whose name men bore. In the next hadith from, of all people, Abd ar-Rahman, we read, Speaking to the clan of the Banu Abdallah, Muhammad said, Allah has given your ancestor an excellent name. As a prophet, Muhammad was an abysmal failure. Ishak, the apostle offered himself to the Arab tribes at the fairs whenever an opportunity arose. He used to ask them to believe in him and protect him. The apostle stopped by the Arab encampments and told him that he was the prophet of Allah, ordering them to worship him, to believe in his messenger, and to protect him until Allah made plain his purpose. He went to the tents of the Hinda and offered himself to them, but they declined. He went to the Abdallah clan with the same message, but they would not heed. The apostle went to the Hanifa, where he met with the worst reception of all. He tried the emir, but one of them said to him, I suppose you want us to protect him from the Arabs with our lives, and then if you prevail, someone else will reap the benefits. Thank you, no. Craving Power and Money Tabari and Ishak. Whenever Muhammad heard of a pilgrim coming to the fairs who was important, he would give special attention to him. Some sheikhs of the Yathrib's Off clan came to Mecca on the Umrah. When Muhammad heard about Zuad's arrival, a poet called the perfect one, he was attentive to him. Zuad said, Perhaps what you are presenting is like what I am saying. The messenger asked, What are you reciting? The book of Luqman, he replied. Luqman was a mythical Arab. He appears in the 31st surah. The messenger said, Hand it to me, so that I can plagiarize it like I have Hanif poetry and Jewish scripture. Zuad handed it over and explained it to him. Muhammad said, This speech is good, but I have better. My speech is a Quran, which Allah has revealed to me. The prophet recited some of it to Zuad. He said, this is a fine saying, and went off rejoining his people. Undeterred, the prophet continued to mill among the crowds, pressing the flesh, as he regaled them with his solicitations. But time was running out. The ritual ceremonies were nearly over. Ishak, the apostle heard about Abdul. He asked them if they would like to get something more profitable than their present errand. Since they were on a religious pilgrimage... Muhammad must have been selling the religion of stolen booty. 
but their leader took a handful of dirt and threw it in Muhammad's face. Now desperate, Allah's boy followed the devotees of the pagan idols on their final procession to Arafat and then back to Mina. In the narrow valley, opportunity knocked. Muhammad shuffled up to a group of pilgrims from Yathrib. What tribe are you from? The tribe of Khazraj. One replied, Ah, the prophet said excitedly, Your tribe is a confederate of the Jews, isn't it? Yes, we are. Then why don't we sit down and chat? A hadith reports, Tabari, when Allah wished to make his religion victorious, with the sword, to render his prophet mighty, with political power, and to fulfill his promise, to make Muhammad rich. The messenger went out during that pilgrimage and met a group of Ansarat Aqaba, the party of the Khazraj. The Ansar, or helpers, are Muslims from Yathrib. At the time, there were none. Ishak. Allah had prepared them for Islam because they lived next to the Jews, who were people of scripture and knowledge. While the Khazraj were polytheists and idolaters, they had gained the mastery over the Jews, raiding them. Whenever any dispute arose, the Jews would say, A prophet will be sent soon. His time is at hand. We shall follow him, and with him as our leader, we shall kill you. This hadith confirms several things that would shape Islam. First, there were Jews in Yathrib, lots of them. They were smart, well-read, and biblically grounded. The Arabs were pagan, and yet they dominated the Jews, something Muhammad would capitalize upon in a big way. When the Jews became frustrated, they did what they have always done. They said, We may be down now, but you just wait. One day our Messiah will come, and things will be different. The expectation of a Messiah was interwoven throughout the whole of Jewish life. As such, it would have been communicated to the Arabs. And no doubt, the idolatrous and illiterate inhabitants of Yathrib would have envied the rich customs and heritage of the Jews. It was the perfect environment for the failed prophet of Mecca. The Arabs in Yathrib, tomorrow's Medina, were ripe for the harvest. Still addicted to idolatrous superstitions, they were just well enough equated with Judaism to swallow Muhammad's corruptions. They were the perfect patsies for his desperate con. Already expecting a Messiah, they readily accepted the reformer of Kusay's Kaaba worship as their prophet. They invited the wolf in sheep's clothing into their midst, a decision they would soon come to regret. But it's ironic in a way. The only reason these Arabs accepted Mohammed was because the Jews, having rejected the real Messiah, were still awaiting his arrival. Otherwise, the good folks in Yathrib would have rejected Mohammed just as everyone else had. Ishak and Tabari after the messenger had spoken to the group from Yathrib, they said, Take note, this is the very prophet whom the Jews are menacing us with. Don't let them find him before we accept him. Because of this, they responded to his call and became Muslims. Finding himself at the right place at the right time, Muhammad fooled the Arabs into thinking that he was the promised Jewish Messiah. Delusions of grandeur had overwhelmed him once again. Muhammad's status in Mecca was so strained, not a word of what occurred over the next twelve months was provided by either Tabari or Ishak. Nothing. They both jumped to the same time the following year. The religion of Islam died, undeniably and absolutely, from the moral decadence of the Quraysh bargain, from the spiritual depravity of the satanic verses, and the hallucinogenic lunacy of the night's journey. Simply stated, Immoral, possessed lunatics don't make good prophets. Ishak and Tabari The following year, twelve of the Ansar came on the pilgrimage and met the messenger, this being the first Aqaba. They took an oath of allegiance to him according to the terms of the Pledge of Women. This was before the duty of making war was laid upon them. A footnote reads, it was called the Pledge of Women because Quran 60 verse 12 told Muhammad to require this from women wanting to become Muslims. Only one small problem. The 60th surah was revealed 11 years later, after Mecca had been conquered. The next hadith explains, Ishaq and Tabari. 
There were twelve of us, and we pledged ourselves to the prophet in the manner of women that was laid out before war was enjoined. The terms were that we should not associate anything with Allah, we should not steal, we should not commit adultery or fornication, should not kill our children, should not slander our neighbors, and we should not disobey Muhammad in what is proper. If we fulfilled this, we would have paradise, and if we failed, Allah would punish us in hell. This became Quran 60.12. Ishaq and Tabari. There were twelve of us, and we pledged ourselves to the Prophet in the manner of women that was laid out before war was enjoined. The terms were that we should not associate anything with Allah, we should not steal, we should not commit adultery or fornication, should not kill our children, should not slander our neighbors, and we should not disobey Muhammad in what is proper. If we fulfilled this, we would have paradise, and if we failed, Allah would punish us in hell. This became Quran 60.12. Chronic post-dating aside, in these two sentences we have come upon more religious substance than has been provided in all of the Islamic scriptures thus far. And while that's bad, it pales in comparison to Muhammad's behavior. He would soon break all of his own rules. Meeting over, we return to radio silence from Mecca. In an 8,000-page book detailing every minuscule detail of Islam's rise, Tabari could find nothing to report from Kabaville. Muhammad was dreaming of greener pastures. Bukhari. The Prophet said, In a dream I saw myself migrating from Mecca to a place having plenty of date trees. I thought that it was Yemen or Hajar, but it came to be Yathrib. The second half of the dream was prophetic, albeit after the fact. I saw myself wielding a sword, and its blade got broken. It came to symbolize the defeat of the Muslims suffered at Uhud. Then I swung the sword again, and it became normal as before, and that was the symbol of the victory Allah bestowed upon Muslims. I saw cows in my dream, and that was a blessing. They symbolized the believers, and the blessing was the reward of Allah after Badar. The battle of Badar did bring faith to a dying religion. And ignorant cows fattened for the slaughter is a telling symbol of Muhammad's view of his fellow Muslims. Caught between two worlds and two quibblas, the prophet didn't know which way to turn. The leader of the gang of Aqaba said, In Tabari, I shall not turn my back on the Kaaba and shall pray toward it. The Meccan Muslims lied. By Allah, we have not heard that our prophet prays in any other direction than Jerusalem and we do not wish to differ from him. Soon thereafter, the gang of twelve frightened their chieftain into joining them. If you remain in your present state, you will be fuel for the flames of hell. When they next met, the chief told Muhammad, Ishak, choose what you want for yourself and for your lord. The messenger recited lurid tales of virgins from the Quran and made us desirous of Islam. Then he said, I will enter a contract of allegiance with you, provided that you protect me as you would your women and children. Contracts are for businessmen. They use them to make money. Allegiances are for politicians. They use them to get to their way. Protection is for pirates, insulating them from the repercussions of the terror they inflict on others. With each word, Islam was beginning to look like a politically minded swindle. The destruction of Islam continued with, Tabari, we pledge our allegiance to you and we defend you as we would our women folk. Administer the oath of allegiance to us, Messenger of Allah, for we are men of war, possessing arms and coats of mail. Motivated by the Prophet, the newly initiated were almost itching for a fight. O Messenger, there are ties between us and the Jews, which we shall have to sever. If we do this and Allah gives you victory... Will you perhaps return to your own people and leave us? Muhammad smiled and said, Nay, blood is blood, and bloodshed without retaliation is blood paid for. You are of me, and I am of you. I shall war against whomever you fight. As it would transpire, he did as they feared. The religious charade was over. The moment the prophet was aligned with men wielding swords, he became a pirating profiteer. If the Karish bargain was his first temptation, 
The pledge of Aqaba was second. He failed both. No one was confused. They knew exactly what they were doing. Ishak and Tabari. Men of the Khazraj, do you know what you are pledging yourselves to in swearing allegiance to this man? Yes, they answered. In swearing allegiance to him, we are pledging ourselves to wage war against all mankind. And with that, the final nail was driven into the coffin of the religion of Islam. They had declared war. Ishak, if you are loyal to this undertaking, it will profit you in this world and the next. They said, We will accept you as prophet under these conditions, but we want to know specifically what we will gain in return for our loyalty. Muhammad answered, I promise you paradise. The advance of political Islam was dependent upon this simple concept. Serve me now, and I promise to reward you later, much later. Tabati reports it this way. What shall we gain for our faithfulness? He answered, Paradise. So reach out your hand. They stretched out their arms and swore in an allegiance to him. Heil, Mohammed! The Nazis saluted Hitler the same way, and the result was the same as well. Ishak and Tabari When we had all sworn the oath of allegiance to the messenger, Satan shouted from the top of Akba in the most piercing and penetrating voice I have ever heard. People of the pagan ritual stations of the idolatrous Hajj of Mina. Do you want to follow a blameworthy reprobate? The messenger said, What does the enemy of God say? I am the devil, and I shall deal with you. It is little wonder, he screamed from the mountaintop. The devil had won a great victory. Chairman Mohammed quickly got down to the business of politics. Appoint twelve Nakub representatives from among you for me, who will see to the people's affairs. They appointed twelve representatives, nine from the Khazraj and three from the Oz. As with all political dictators, the Nakub representatives were camouflage, little more than window dressing. There is no record of them ever meeting. Ishak the following morning, Quraysh leaders came to our encampment saying that they had heard that we had invited Muhammad to leave them and that we had pledged ourselves to support him in war against them. Thereupon, members of our tribe swore that nothing of the kind had happened and that we knew nothing of it. Lying was the first thing these Muslims did after pledging to war against all mankind. There is an important lesson here, one our politicians and media are missing. Tabari when the Quraysh came to recognize what had really happened, they urged one another to torment the Muslims and treat them harshly. After all, Muhammad had just upped the ante, moving from a war of words to a clash of swords. The Muslims suffered great hardship. And that's because, in Tabari, those present at the oath of Aqaba had sworn an allegiance to Muhammad. It was a pledge of war against all men. Allah had permitted fighting. Jihad was born. The pendulum had swung. The peace-loving religion born in Mecca was abrogated. Tabari, after Allah had given his messenger permission to fight by revealing the verse, and fight them until persecution is no more and religion is all for Allah, this became Quran 8.39. The messenger of Allah commanded, not persuaded or even asked, those at Mecca to emigrate to Yathrib and join their brethren, the Ansar. And wouldn't you know it, Muhammad couldn't even get that right. The Eighth Surah, aptly named the Spoils of War, was revealed after the Battle of Badar, several years later. His God was doing his level best to accommodate his prophet's ambitions. His timing was off, and that's all. Ishak, when Allah gave permission to his apostle to fight, the second Aqaba contained conditions involving war which were not in the first act of submission. Now we bound ourselves to war against all mankind for Allah and his apostle. He promised us a reward in paradise for faithful service. We pledged ourselves to war in complete obedience to Muhammad, no matter how evil the circumstances. And they were evil indeed. Ishak lists the signatories of the Declaration of Submission. Uhud commanded the apostles' archers. He was killed in the Battle of Yemen. 
during the War of Compulsion. As a martyr, Abu was present at all the Apostles' battles and died in Byzantine territory as a martyr. Muad was present at every raid. He was killed at Badar as a martyr. Mawid, his brother, shared in the same glory. Umara was at every battle and died a martyr in Yemen. Assad died before Badar, when the Prophet's mosque was being built. The Apostle put Amar in command of the rear guard. He died at Uhud as a martyr. Abdallah led many raids and was slain as a martyr at Muta. He was one of Muhammad's commanders. Khalad fought at Badar, Uhud, and Kandak. He was martyred fighting the Jewish Kareza. The Apostle said that he would have the reward of two martyrs. The list goes on and on, but you get the picture. Islam kills. Christ's Apostle died as martyrs trying to save men. They used words, not swords. Their sacrifice was a living testament to their faith. Muhammad's companions died wielding swords, sacrificing the lives of others to satiate their own cravings. Christ and Muhammad, Christianity and Islam, the Bible and the Quran, Yahweh and Allah, are opposites. Ishak, the apostle had not been allowed to fight or shed blood before the second Aqaba. He had simply been ordered to call men to Allah, to endure insult and forgive the ignorant. Camel dung, every word of it. The apostle didn't have the ability to fight prior to the Pledge of Allegiance. The instant he wielded influence over men of war, he went to war against those who had insulted him. I shall bring you slaughter, was how this retrobate defined forgiveness. Ishak. The Quraysh persecuted his followers, seducing some from their religion and exiling others. They became insolent towards Muhammad's God and rejected his gracious purpose. They accused his prophet of lying. So he gave permission to his apostle to fight those who had wronged him. He said in his Quran, Fight them so that there will be no more seduction. In other words, no more exposing Islam's faults. Until no Muslim is seduced from Islam, fight them until the only religion is Islam and Allah alone is worshipped. This became Quran 2240 and 2198. That's reasonably clear. Worship Allah or Muslims will kill you. As a result, every Meccan Muslim, save Bakar and Ali, scurried off to Yathrib. Tabari. The Quraysh were now anxious about Muhammad going there, as they knew he had decided to join them in order to make war on them. The Meccans read him like an open book, just as we are doing. Unfortunately for the billions of souls that have been lost to this ruse, They acted, as we do today, in the face of Islamic aggression and terror. Tabari and Ishak They deliberated as to what to do about Muhammad as they had come to fear him. One said, Keep him in fetters, lock him up, and wait for the same kind of death to overtake him, which overtook other poets of this sort. A handsome sheikh, Muslims say, was really the devil, protested. If you imprison him, his followers will attack and snatch him away. Then their numbers will grow so large they will destroy the authority of the Quraysh. Sorry, Sheikh, but that's ridiculous. In twelve years of preaching, Muhammad had seduced fewer than one hundred souls, and most of them abandoned Islam in the aftermath of the Quraysh bargain, satanic verses, and night's journey. He was his own worst enemy. Another suggested... Let us expel him from among us and banish him from the land. The harm which he has been doing will disappear, and we shall be rid of him. We shall be able to put our affairs back in order and restore our social harmony. This sounds eerily like yesterday's newspaper. The Meccans were as wrongly fixated on a singular person as we are today. Islamic terror survived Muhammad's death because the religion manufactured more Mohammeds, Bakers, Ali's, Umar, Uthman's, Osama bin Laden's, and Saddam Hussein's. By failing to understand the motivations behind Islam, and by focusing on a symptom rather than the disease, the Meccans lost their children, their property, their social, their economic system, and their freedoms, as shall we. The Quraysh were waylaid by Islam's religious trappings. 
If they had existed back then, I'm sure the most enlightened Meccans would have paraded the peace-loving Muslims out on CNN, ABC, and CBS to reveal the true character of the doctrine that had just declared war. Give peace a chance, they would have protested, as the murderous marauders grew ever stronger, corrupting more souls. As a direct result of their ignorance, the balance of power shifted. Their economy was plundered by the peaceful religion. Their people were kidnapped, ransomed, robbed, enslaved, raped, assassinated, and terrorized. The Meccans finally woke up and waged a war of sorts, but it was too little, too late. The devil, masquerading as an Arab sheik, spoke on behalf of his messenger. To Badi and Ishak, By Allah, this is not judicious. Do you not see the beauty of his discourse, the sweetness of his speech, and how he dominates the hearts of men with the compelling force of the message he brings? By Allah, if you expel him, I think it's likely that he will descend upon some other Arab tribe and win them over with his recitals, so that they will follow him and adopt his plans. He will lead them against you. They will attack crush you, seize your power, rob you, and do with you whatever he wants. The devil was right. He did those very things. Tabari and Ishak. Thereupon Abu Jal said, I think that we should take one young, strong, well-born man from each clan and give each a sharp sword. They should make for him and strike him with their swords as one man and kill him. This sounds hauntingly similar to the United States pleading with its allies and the UN to form a multinational coalition to go after the legacy of Mohammed, Islamic terror. Not surprisingly, it worked as poorly for them as it does us today. By the time all of the allegiances had been duly formed and all factions had been sufficiently bribed, the terrorist leader had snuck away. While he was in the neighborhood, the devil, masquerading as the sheik, went to Mohammed in his true form in the likeness of an angel. Gabriel came to the messenger and said, Do not spend this night in the bed in which you usually sleep. When the first third of the night had passed, the young men gathered at his door and waited for him to go to sleep so that they could fall upon him. When Muhammad saw what they intended to do, he said to Ali, who was his adoptive son, Lie on my bed and wrap yourself up in my green cloak, the one I use when I go to bed. Nothing unpleasant will befall you from them. What a weasel. With a mob of men wielding swords standing outside his door, he told his son to wear his pajamas and lie in his bed. I'm not sure there's even a word to describe such cowardly and despicable behavior. Tabari Muhammad said to Ali, If Abu Bakr comes to you, tell him that I have gone to Thawr, and ask him to join me. Send me some food, and hire a guide for me who can show me the road to Yathrib, and buy me a riding camel. Then the messenger went off, and Allah blinded the sight of those who were lying in wait for him, so he departed without them seeing him. In other words, he snuck out the back door. After all, if Allah had blinded the multinational coalition... There would have been no need for Ali to wear the fearless prophet's PJs. Body and Ishak. Among those who had gathered against him was Abu Jal. He said, while waiting at his door, Muhammad alleges that if we follow him, we shall be kings over the Arabs and the Persians. Then, after we die fighting for him, we shall be brought back to life and live in gardens like those in Jordan. He also claims that if we do not submit to him, we shall be slaughtered. After his followers kill us, we shall be brought back to life and thrown into the fires of hell in which we shall burn. The pagan Abu Jal encapsulated the whole of Islam in the Quran. It is sobering. How can something so clear escape the grasp of so many? Muhammad even confessed to the crime. Allah's messenger came out and took a handful of dust and said, Yes, I do say that, and you are one of them. Allah took away their sight so that they could not see him. Just as we have been blinded today. And Muhammad began to sprinkle the dust of ignorance and complacency on their heads while reciting the following verses. 
Ya Sin, I call to witness the Quran. You are the one sent on a straight path. The sentence is justified against most of them, for they do not believe. We will certainly put iron collars on their necks, which will come up to their chins, so they will not be able to raise their heads. And we have set a barrier before them and cover them, so they will not be able to see. This became Quran 36.1. Once again, the Islamic God's timing was off, but his heart was in the right place. Quran 36 was handed down 30 surahs and three years before the great escape. By the time he had finished reciting these verses, he had put the dust on the heads of each one of them. And he saved his son, right? No. After which he went to where he wished to go. Before we hightail it out of the quarrelsome confines of the barren and hostile Meccan Valley, I'd like to examine some of the final surahs handed down during the War of Words. Considering the mood, why not start with, Taha! Quran 20, verse 1. Taha! We have not sent down the Quran to you to be an occasion for your distress. Nay, it is an admonition to those who fear. Skipping ahead to the 8th verse. Allah, there is no Allah save Him. His are the most beautiful names. Contemplating the problem of replacing our Rachman with Allah, a second translation says, To Him belong the most beautiful attributes. Quran 20, verse 9. Has the story of Moses reached you? <laughs> An incredible question, since it has been replayed ten times. The dark spirit seems to have contracted Alzheimer's. Behold, he saw a fire, so he said to his folk, Terry, I perceive a fire. Perhaps I can bring you some burning brand, or find some guidance at the fire. Following this lame introduction, Allah manages to butcher Yahweh's meeting with Moses at the burning bush. Quran 20, verse 14. Verily, I am Allah. No Illah, or God, may be worshipped but I. So serve you me, and perform regular prostration prayer for my praise. Verily, the hour is coming. I am almost hiding it from myself. Prostrating Jews, a Hebrew deity named Allah, and godly surprises. Only from the mind of Muhammad. Confused as ever, Allah has Moses play with his staff before encountering Pharaoh. Quran 20:17. And what is that in your right hand, Moses? It is my rod. I lean on it. I beat down fodder for my flocks, and in it I find other uses. He said, Cast it down. Moses threw it, and behold, it was a snake, a serpent gliding. Allah loves snakes. Yahweh, however, had a different agenda. His goal was to free his chosen people from bondage. Yet liberating Jews didn't suit Muhammad's scheme. His problem was freeing himself from the pesky Meccans. Quran twenty twenty four, Go to Pharaoh, for he has indeed transgressed all bounds. He said, Lord, open for me my chest, ease my task, and loose the knot from my tongue. Muhammad, not Moses wanted these things. Next we find the prophet of doom putting his words into Moses' mouth. Quran 20:48. Verily it has been revealed to us that the penalty of doom awaits those who reject and deny. Acting more Meccan than Egyptian, Pharaoh challenged his tormentor's credibility, asking for some proof. But the surrogate Muhammad didn't have any. Quran 20:51. Pharaoh said, What about previous generations? Moses replied, The knowledge is with my Lord, recorded in a book. My Lord never errs nor forgets. And we showed Pharaoh all our signs, but he did reject and refuse. What book? And why did the Lord need a book if he never forgets? Then missing the point entirely, Allah has Pharaoh say, In Quran 20 verse 57, have you come to drive us out of our land with your magic, Moses? Verse 60. Pharaoh devised his plot. Moses said, Woe to you! Forge not a lie against Allah, lest he destroy you by torment. The chronic dialogue disintegrates into bickering reminiscent of Mecca. Quran 20, 62. 
So they disputed with one another, but kept their talk secret. They said, These two are magicians. Their object is to drive you out of your land with their magic. They want to do away with your most cherished institutions, driving out your chiefs. So the magicians were flung down to prostration, crying, We believe in the Lord of Aaron and Moses. Pharaoh said, Do you believe in him before I give you permission? He must be your chief who has taught you magic. Be sure I will cut off your hands and feet on opposite sides. I will have you crucified on trunks of palm trees, so you shall know for certain which of us can give the more severe and lasting punishment. Well, every surah attests to the fact the Quran wasn't divinely inspired. Some passages are more revealing than others. This one is a real prize. Crucifixion was invented by the Assyrians, but not until 500 B.C. Moses returned to Pharaoh in 1200 B.C., which makes this Quranic conversation impossible. Something wholly inconsistent with a book claiming to be perfect. But the Islamic God did more than crucify himself on the tree of ignorance. A moral God cannot compete for the prize of most severe punisher. In Allah's final Quranic address, he spoke these chilling words. Quran 5, verse 33, The punishment for those who wage war against Allah and His Apostle, and perpetrate disorders in the land, is to crucify them, or have a hand on one side and a foot on the other cut off. The most important aspect of the liberation of the Jews from Egyptian bondage, Passover, was missed by Muhammad and his prop Allah. Since Islamic forgiveness was arbitrary and capricious, not as a result of sacrifice, they didn't comprehend the significance of the blood of the Lamb. As a prophet and God, they should have known that it was symbolic of Christ's mission. Lamb's blood was smeared on a horizontal beam, a beam that became the threshold to salvation. Yes, there was a cross in the story of Moses, but you had to be more godly than Mohammed to see it. Twenty verses later, Allah forgets his name, and Aaron thinks he is Muhammad. Quran 20, verse 90. Aaron had indeed told them earlier, O oh, my people, you are being misled with this. Surely your Lord is Arachman, so follow me and obey my command. Jump ahead a few verses, and the deities are still at it, plagiarizing the Bible and making fools of themselves. Quran 20, 96. Samari replied, I saw what they saw not, so I took a handful of dust from the footprints of the messenger and threw it. Thus did my gut suggest to me. Moses said, Get done, your punishment in this life will not be such as you say. Touch me not. Moreover, you have a curse on you that you cannot escape. Now look at your illa, of whom you have become devoted. We will burn it and scatter it in the sea. But your illa is Allah. There is no illa but He. Thus do we relate to you some stories of what happened before from our own remembrance. Ever in character, our Rockman or Allah, is or are, about to melt down in the midst of an identity crisis. Quran 20, verse 100. Whoever turns aside from it, he shall bear a burden on the day of doom. They will abide in that. Grievous evil will be the load on them. We shall gather the mushrimum, disbeliever, blue or blind-eyed with thirst. My Lord will blast them and scatter them as dust. Verse 108. Their voices will be hushed before our Rachman. You will not hear a sound but faint shuffling. That day no intercession will matter other than his whom our Rachman grants permission. Verse 113. Thus we have sent the Quran down as a lecture in Arabic and explained the intimidations and different threats that they might fear Allah. It's another Islamic first. God in the role of bully, the great intimidator. And thus his Quran is not a discussion between God and man. It is a lecture. Quran 21.14 High above all is Allah the king, which made Muhammad king, since he was the only semblance of Allah's existence. Do not try to anticipate the Quran before its revelation comes to you, Muhammad. That's almost funny. It's obvious he was making this up as he went along. 
Because he was unable to heed the following words, he had to author scripture to excuse his immoral and covetous behavior. Quran 20 verse 131 Do not covet what we have granted to other people, nor strain your eye in longing for the things we have given for their enjoyment, the splendor of the life through which we tempt them. But the provision of your Lord is better and more enduring. Islam's dark spirit was about to make thievery legal, and thereby fulfilled his promise to enrich his profiteer. Scripture would soon serve to satiate Muhammad's sexual cravings as well. Before we throw up or die laughing, let's leave the Taha Surah with this disclaimer from Muhammad's spirit friend. Quran 20 verse 133 They say, Why does he not bring us a sign or miracle from his Lord? Has not a clear sign come to them in the former scripture books of Revelation? The devil just said, If you want a real God and miracles, you need to read Yahweh's scriptures, the Bible. It took us a while, but we found a nugget of truth in the Quran. The 21st surah, named The Prophets, was revealed during Muhammad's waning days in Mecca. In earlier chapters, we covered the heart of this surah. On this pass, we'll just pick up some of the remaining highlights. It opens immersed in the never-ending feud. Quran 21, verse 2. Never comes to them a renewed reminder from their Lord, but they listen to it in jest, playing in sport, their hearts toying with trifles. The wrongdoers conceal their private counsels, conferring in secret, He is just a man like yourselves, a mortal. Will you succumb to his witchcraft with your eyes open? Say, My Lord is the one that hears and knows. Nay, they say, these are merely medleys of muddled dreams. He forged it. He is just a poet. Let him then bring us a miracle like the ones that were sent to the prophets of old. This is the complete package. Muhammad's contemporaries ridiculed his Quranic revelations. They called him a counterfeiter, a witch, a muddled dreamer, and a mere poet. They said that he lacked any proof for his far-fetched claims of divine selection and inspiration. And clearly they knew him much better than we do today. Quran 21, verse 6. Not one of the populations which we destroyed believed. Will these believe? And we sent not before you but men whom we revealed. Ask the keepers of the reminder, the scriptures, Torah, and gospel, if you do not know. Nor did we give them bodies that ate not food, nor were they immortals. Then we fulfilled to them the promise. So we saved them, and whom we pleased, and we destroyed the disbelievers. The Islamic God just asked Muslims to check with the Jews if they were looking for answers. Using a moron to argue with a village of illiterates, the ignorant deity said, Quran 21 verse 10, Verily we have sent down for you a book in which is your reminder. Have you then no sense? Returning to his favorite theme, How many towns have we utterly destroyed because of their wrongs, exchanging them for other people? When they felt our torment, behold, they began to fly. Fly not, but return to that which emasculated you, so that you might be interrogated. They cried, Woe to us! Their crying did not cease, till we mowed them down as ashes, silent and quenched. The Islamic God, also known as Satan, is bragging about how many civilizations he destroyed, demonstrating the godless mindset of a concentration camp warden. He said that he emasculated men, interrogating them, making them cry. Then he mowed them down, turning their bodies into ashes. It's little wonder Hitler based Mein Kampf on Islam. The next passage takes us from demented to delusional. Quran 21, verse 16. Not for sport did we create the heavens, earth, and all that is in between. It wasn't a plaything. If it had been our wish to take a pastime, to make a diversion or a hobby, like a wife or a son, we surely could have made it ourselves, in our presence, if we would do. While this is weird, the last line is revealing, Yahweh is infinite, Allah is not. The heavens and earth are outside his presence. Quran 21, 18. 
Nay, we fling the true against the false, and it knocks out its brains. In a way, it's true. Hurl enough of this stuff at someone, and they'll lose their mind. Behold, it is vanquished. Ah, woe be to you for that thing you ascribe. To him belong all creatures in the heavens and earth. Those who are near him are not too proud to serve, nor are they weary. Moving ahead, we return to the never-ending argument. Quran 2124 Say, bring your proof. This is the reminder book for those before me, but most do not know and are adverse. Unable to read, neither God nor prophet knew that a recital was not a book, and that their lecture was diametrically opposed to the reminder book they were referencing. As a result, they insisted that the gods and books were the same. Quran 21.25 not a messenger did we send before you, but we revealed to him, La ilaha, illa ana, no gods but I. So worship me. Incredibly, this assertion of a singular divinity is followed by, verse 26, And yet they say, Arachman has begotten a son, too exalted is he. Most translations, trying to hide their God's duplicity, mistranslate the passage, Allah, most gracious, has begotten offspring. But they have to put Allah in parentheses because it's not really there. If Muslims have to deceive us to keep their God together, their God isn't in any better shape than the fractured rock they call his home. This verse was the first of many designed to demean Christ. Yeshua, Jesus' real name, claimed to be God. Quran 21, verse 29 if any of them should say, I am an Illah, or God, besides him, such a one we should reward with hell. If Allah is right, the Messiah is burning in hell, which is indeed where the dark spirit would like to see him. But then again, since hell is separation from God, it wouldn't be hell anymore. It's time for the Islamic God, whatever his name might be, to prove his divinity once again. Quran 21, verse 26. Don't the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together in one piece before we clove them asunder? We made from water every living thing. Will they not believe? And we have set the earth on mountains as stabilizers, lest the earth should convulse without them. And we have made therein broad highways for them to pass through, that they may be guided. We have made the heaven a roof, well guarded. Yet they turn away from its signs. All the celestial bodies swim along on a course, floating. Yes, indeed. Celestial bodies swim, and mountains prevent earthquakes. It's little wonder unbelievers were prone to ridicule. Quran 21, verse 36. When the disbelievers see you, Muhammad, they treat you with ridicule, choosing you out for mockery. Is this he who mentions your gods? Yet they disbelieve at the mention of Arachman. If Arachman were Allah, this conversation would be impossible, because Allah was a Meccan god. They believed in him, in his Kaaba, in his black stone. He was their meal ticket. However, since Arachman was a competitive idol the god of the Yemeni Hanifs, the godly confusion was understandable. But while it made sense, it destroyed Islam's central claim. It's only reason for being. There is no illa but Allah. The next verse returns to pain and punishment, because there is an illa, and he is not Allah. Quran 21.37 Man is created of haste, I will show you my signs, then you will not ask me to hasten them. They say, When will this come to pass if you are telling the truth? If only the unbelievers knew when, they will not be able to ward off the fire from their faces nor their backs. Nay, it will come to them all of a sudden and stupefy them. They will be unable to repel or avert it. Punishment over, Arachman explains that all of his prophets were as bad as Muhammad. Quran 2141 Mocked were messengers before you, but their scoffers were hemmed in by what they mocked. Say, who can protect you from the wrath of Arachman? Will they turn away from the mention of their Lord? Have they Ahila, 
O gods, who can defend them against us from our torment? A Meccan would never have turned away from Allah. Yet all should run from this spirit, lest they become its prey. Quran 21, verse 44. Do they see us advancing, gradually reducing the land under their control, curtailing its borders on all sides? It is they who will be overcome. Sounds like our Rachman is promoting an Islamic land grab. In the next 30 verses, Muhammad recreates Abraham in his image. Then he moves on to Isaac, Lot, Noah, David, Solomon, Job, Ishmael, Jonah, Zechariah, and John. We learn that Mary was a virgin whose chastity was preserved by Allah so that he could breathe his spirit into her, producing a token for mankind. That brings us to Quran 21, verse 98. Verily, you unbelievers and that which you worship besides Allah are but faggots for the hell fire. And come to it you will. There, sobbing and groaning will be your lot. You will not hear anything else. The Surah's final verses tell us that the good reward for those preordained by us will be to safely avoid the mighty terror. The devil says the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll, reverted to nothing. And we prescribe the book of Psalms. The last Meccan hurrah was the 46th Surah. Let's see how Team Islam said goodbye to their friends. Quran 46 verse 1. Hamim. Only Allah knows their meaning. The revelation of the book is from Allah, Almighty, All-Wise. Introductions made, it's time for the 100th rendition of... Say, do you see what you invoke besides Allah? Show me. What they have created of earth or heaven, bring me a book revealed before this scripture, or any trace of knowledge in support of your claims, if you are truthful. As you know, Muhammad didn't have a book. Under the most favorable scenario, it would be 20 years and 24 surahs before the first Quran was inscribed, and even then it lacked any trace of knowledge. Next, we are asked to endure the Day of Doom, take 100. Quran 46, verse 6. And when men are gathered, they will be hostile enemies and reject worship. Followed by the 100th rerun of Our Clear Signs. When our clear signs are rehearsed to them, the unbelievers say, This is evident sorcery. It is a fabrication. The Meccan surahs could be reduced to a single-page essay if we merely cut out things that didn't belong. Plagiarized Hanif poetry, corrupted Bible stories, Cusay's pagan scam, the never-ending argument, threats of pain and punishment, mind-numbing repetition, and incomprehensible gibberish. By way of example, Quran 46, verse 8. Or do they say, he has forged it? Say, if I fabricate it, still you have no power to support me against Allah. He knows best that whereof you talk so glibly. Sufficient is he a witness between you and me. Translated into English, illiterate sorcerers sound foolish when they forge scripture. But occasionally we find a morsel of truth. Quran 46 verse 9. Say, I am no bringer of a newfangled doctrine among the messengers. Apart from his warped depictions of heaven and hell, Muhammad was a copier, not an inventor. The next line was also true. Nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. As was the next one, but not in the way Muhammad intended. I follow that which is inspired in me. I am but a warner. There was no question that Muhammad was inspired, but so was every monopolist and tyrant. And the inspired in me line was a confession. Throughout time, the greatest cons have left clues. It's part of the game. Quran 46, verse 10. Bethink you. If this be from Allah, and you reject it, and a witness from among the children of Israel testifies to its similarity of Allah's Quran with the earlier Torah, and believe while you are arrogant and spurn it, lo, Allah guides not wrongdoing folk. By saying that the Quran was similar to Jewish scripture, Allah confirmed his ignorance. 
As for the Islamic God bragging about finding a Jew who was willing to endorse his hellish rant, that's hilarious, as desperate as it is pathetic. If the Sirah is accurate, Muhammad found one Jew among 30,000 in Medina he was able to bribe. Islam's prophet gave Abdallah bin Salam, an unlikely name for a Jew, a house he had stolen from others. The never-ending argument marched on. Quran 46.11 The disbelievers say to the believers, Had this Islam been a good thing, such men as they would not have gone to it before us. And seeing that they do not guide themselves thereby, they will say, This is an ancient falsehood, the same old lie. This has merit. The Meccans were saying, If this message were so good, bad people like Muhammad and his gang wouldn't be the only ones attracted to it. If the message were worthy, they wouldn't be hypocrites, ignoring what they had preached. If the religion had substance, why did Muhammad capitulate to the Quraysh bargain? Why did he indulge in the satanic verses? Why did he hallucinate the night's journey? Quran 46.12 Before this was the scripture book of Moses, the Torah, as a guide. This book, the Quran, confirms and verifies it in the Arabic tongue to admonish the unjust as glad tidings to the good doers. This is one of the Quran's most suicidal lines. The conflicts between Torah and Quran are so great, and the differences between Yahweh and Allah are so extreme, both cannot be divine. The nucleus of the Torah is the Ten Commandments, yet Muhammad murdered every one of them. Logic, therefore, dictates, if the Torah was inspired, the Quran cannot be, for it contradicts the Torah at every turn. If the Torah wasn't inspired, then the Quran cannot be, because it claims it was. This is the Islamic version of Russian roulette. Every chamber is loaded. There is no way to win. Quran 46.13 Verily those who say, Our Lord is Allah, and remain firm, on them shall be no fear. Such shall abide in the garden. Yet the previous surah said that the Lord was our Rachman, and that fearing him was required for admittance. Now there is no fear, and the magic words are, Our Lord is Allah. Which one, if either, is true? It's time for a celebration now. It took a while to find one, but the next verse is positive. Quran 46.15 We have enjoined on man's kindness to his parents. With reluctance did his mother bear him, and in pain did she give him birth. The bearing of, and his weaning, is thirty months. At length, till he reaches full strength, at the age of forty years, he says, My Lord, arouse me that I might be grateful for your favor which you favored me and my parents, that I may do deeds acceptable to you. Be good to me in the matter of my seed. I turn to you and I surrender in Islam. We are 281 pages into this detailed presentation of the five scripture books that comprise Islam. And this is the first verse that is positive. It makes you wonder. But as we review the final ten years of Muhammad's life, I will let you judge whether he practiced what he preached. Then we are told, This is nothing but the tales of the ancients. Those who are utterly lost are losers sharing the same sentence as the previous nations of jinn and men, and all are assigned degrees according to their deeds. Which brings us to Quran 46.20 On that day the unbelievers will be placed before the fire. It will be said to them, You squandered your good things in this life, and you sought comfort from them. But today you shall be rewarded with a penalty of humiliation. To prove Allah ranked number one in People's Pumbled, the big guy reminds us of his dealings with the mythical ad. Quran 46.21 and make mention of Hud, one of Ad's brethren. Behold, he warned his people about the winding sand tracks. But there have been warners before him and after him. Worship none other than Allah. I fear for you the penalty of doom. Transitioning from punishments to arguments. Quran 46.22 They, the Meccans, 
said, If you have come in order to turn us away from our gods, then bring upon us the calamity you threaten with, if you are telling the truth. He, Muhammad, said, The knowledge of when it will come is only with Allah. I proclaim to you the mission on which I have been sent, but I see that you are a people in ignorance. The first person speaker in this divine revelation is Muhammad, not Allah. The passage lacks the say trappings that are normally used to make Muhammad's words appear like they are coming from his God. This time he goofed. Representing an impotent deity must have been as grating as the wind-blown sand. All Muhammad could do was threaten. Quran 46.24 Then, when they saw the penalty in the shape of a cloud advancing toward their valleys, they said, This will give us rain. Nay, it is the calamity you are asking to be hastened, a blast of wind with a painful torment, destroying all things by the command of its Lord. Then, by the morning, nothing was to be seen but the ruins of their houses. Thus do we reward the disbelievers. While the words are muddled, the message is clear. Allah was a terrorist. Blending the never-ending argument with pain and punishment, Allah said, Quran 46.26 And we firmly establish them in power, which we have not given to you, Quraysh, and we endowed them with hearing, seeing, and intellect, but they were of no profit to them when they went on rejecting the signs and verses of Allah. Allah has just told us that he made the Quraysh weak, blind, deaf, and dumb. Muhammad, incidentally, was Quraysh. And they were completely encircled by that which they used to mock. We destroyed populations round about you, and we have shown the signs in various ways that they may turn. That said, we come to the Ta'if, demonic endorsement we covered earlier. Quran 46.29 And remember, when we turned a company of jinn toward you, Muhammad, to listen to the Quran, and they arrived when it was being recited, and they said, Keep silent. When it was over, they came back to their people, warning them, O oh, people, we have listened to a book, which actually doesn't exist, which has come down after Moses, confirming, actually corrupting, what was sent down before it, showing the straight path to hell. Quran 46.31 Our people, fellow demons, listen to the summoner of Allah and believe in him, Muhammad, so that he can forgive you and save you from a painful doom. Muhammad may have been a miracleless, prophecyless, inspirationless loser, but that didn't stop devils from claiming that he was just like Christ. Believe in him and he will save you, the demons proclaimed. Quran 46.32 He who does not respond to the summoner of Allah does not weaken the power of Allah on earth. Don't they see Allah who created the heavens and the earth and was never tired with their creation, is able to give life to the dead? Yea, he is able to do all things. Muhammad is saying, my God is better than your God, because my God didn't need to rest on the seventh day. Yet how can Allah be better than Yahweh, if they are supposed to be the same? On the day the unbelievers are placed before the fire, they will say, is this real? Yes, it is, by the Lord. Taste the penalty you denied. Predictably, the Meccan farewell address ends focused on doom. Quran 46.35 have patience, Muhammad, even as the other messengers. Seek not to hasten their doom. On that day they will see the punishment they are promised. This is the perfect place for a Quranic review. I have quoted passages from 90 of the Quran's 114 surahs. Half of those have been reviewed in their entirety, including every surah handed down during the first five years. The score of Meccan surahs I passed over can be summarized as follows. The Mohammedized stories of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Moses, Pharaoh, Jesus, and Mary are collectively retold 100 times. Jonah, Joshua, Jacob, Joseph, and Job are added to the mix with a surah named in Jonah's honor. Another is dedicated entirely to Joseph. The Jewish kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, 
are shown cavorting with devils in stories shamelessly plagiarized from the Talmud, Jewish myths and folklore. The crude recasting suit Muhammad's agenda, and they are as transparent as they are obnoxious. But this pales in comparison to the never-ending argument and the dreadful tales of pain and punishment. Religious thought apart from that stolen from Moses, Kusay, and Zayed is sparse. Now that we've closed the book on Mecca, how do you suppose our bastion of prophetic piety responded to the demise of his wife and uncle, his benefactor and his protector? Before the body of his seventy-year-old wife Khadijah was cold, the fifty-year-old prophet married Asia, a six-year-old child. Pedophilia notwithstanding, the aging religious leader tried polygamy next. He married Sada, an emigrant from Abyssinia, on his way out of town. His behavior towards Abu Talib was equally callous. Ishak, Abu Jal, with sundry other notables, went to Talib and said, We acknowledge your rank, but now that you are near death, we are deeply concerned. You know the trouble that exists between us and your nephew, so call him and let us make an agreement that he will leave us alone and we will leave him alone. The messenger arrived, and Abu said, Nephew, these noble men have come to give you something and gain something in return. Muhammad said, Can you give me words by which you can rule the Arabs and subject the Persians to you? How about ten words, Abu Jal said, knowing the drill. Muhammad replied, You must say, There is no Illah but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. They clapped their hands and said, Do you want us to make all the Illahs into one Illah, Muhammad? That would be an extraordinary thing. Muhammad's Islam was about money and power, to be sure. But what was the fate of those who helped him along the way? Ishak, if you say those words, Uncle Abu, then I shall be able to intercede for you on Resurrection Day. Abu Talib didn't and died. His brother Abbas claimed that on his deathbed he moved his lips. So Abbas came running to Muhammad and said, Nephew, my brother has spoken the words you gave him to say. The apostle replied, I didn't hear them. Bukhari. A Muslim said to the prophet, You were not of any help to your uncle Abu, even though he used to protect you. The prophet said, He is in a shallow fire, and had it not been for me, he would have been in the bottom of hell fire. In contrast to the depraved behavior of the Muslim prophet, a notable pagan performed admirably. Remember Uncle Lahab? Upon hearing of Khadijah's and Talib's death, he went to the Kaaba and proclaimed, Muhammad has suffered a great loss. Attack him no longer. Unimpressed, Muhammad was ready to move on. When last we saw him, he had dressed his son up in his pajamas and was sprinkling magic dust on his enemies' heads. To body. Some assert that Bakr came to Ali and asked him about the prophet. He told him that he had gone to the cave of Thawar in the darkness of night. The prophet heard Bakr coming and thought he was one of the polytheists. He increased his pace and his sandal strap snapped. He skinned his big toe on a stone. And it bled profusely. Bakr was afraid that he would scare Muhammad, so he spoke to him before they reached the cave at dawn and went inside. Meanwhile, back in Mecca, the locals scolded Ali and beat him, proving that Allah was powerless and Muhammad wasn't a prophet. They took him to the mosque and imprisoned him for a while. About this, Allah revealed, And when the unbelievers plot against you to kill you or drive you out, they plot, but Allah plots too, and Allah is the best plotter. The Arabic word for plotter could just as easily have been translated schemer. The scheming prophet had found the perfect God. The next hadith says that Baker and Muhammad set off together rather than separately. And while that's a contradiction, it's not the most disturbing part of the tradition. We learn that Baker's son, born like his sister Asia, years after Allah anointed his messenger, was named Abd al-Rahman. Asia recalls the prophet's paranoia. Ishak Muhammad never failed to come by our house every day at the two ends of the day. Once he came during the heat of the day, so we knew that it was because of something special. 
When he came in, Dad rose from his bed, and the messenger sat down. Muhammad said, Send out those who are with you. My father said, Prophet, these are my daughters. One of which is now your wife. They can do you no harm. May my father and mother be your ransom. Tabari. According to what I have been told, the messenger is said to have informed Ali that he was leaving and to have commanded him to stay behind to hand back those things which people had entrusted to his custody. Everyone in Mecca who had any possessions would deposit it with Muhammad because they knew of his honesty. Oh, sure. That squares nicely with the demon-possessed, lying sorcerer theme complained about incessantly in the Quran, don't you think? Ishak. When the messenger decided upon departure, he went to Bakr and the two of them left by a window in the back of Abu's house and went to the cave of Thawar in the mountain below Mecca. This time there was no plot, no multinational alliance, no swordsman lurking outside Mohammed's house, no warning from Gabriel, no pajamas or Ali in bed, no fairy dust, no blind men, no stubbed toe and no scripture handed down commemorating the great escape. As such, it seems that Islam is the only religion in which no one, from God to prophet, can tell the truth. And that's because the prophet's Lord became his ambition. His paradise reflected his fantasies. His hell was a manifestation of the revenge he craved, a payment for the torment he had endured as a child. This was all a nasty charade. Somewhere in this mound of manure, in this transparent plagiarism, mindless repetition, odious schemes, obnoxious arguments, and demented threats, I had hoped to find a glimmer of original inspiration so that I could provide some semblance of balance. But there is none. Islam as a religion perished in the blazing heat and driving sands of Mecca, only to rise from the ashes as a political doctrine in Yathrib. The ritualistic trappings that survived the desert crossing were simply used to manipulate future subjects. It was only 250 miles, but most everything changed. Arachman became an attribute, and Allah became God. And what a God he was, one who was ever ready to condone whatever suited his prophet's personal agenda. Fighting, assassination, genocide, rape, incest, polygamy, lying, racism, and thievery. The war of words turned violent. The Meccans were robbed and plundered. But that was child's play compared to the fate of the Jews. They went from allies to enemy faster than you can say, massacre them. While the score following twelve years of wrangling in Mecca ended Islam 50, pagans 4,950, the game wasn't over, not by a long shot. In fact, the battle was just beginning. Tabati, Volume 6, page 157 says, under the banner, Institution of the Islamic Era. It is said that when Allah's messenger came to Medina, this would be September 622 A.D., he ordered the establishment of a new era. They used to reckon time by the number of months after Muhammad's arrival. As with all things Islam, the statement attributed to Muhammad wasn't true, but it demonstrated a crucial mindset. It was actually Umar, the second caliph, who ordered the institution of the Islamic calendar. He established Muhammad's Hirja, or migration to Medina, as the first year of the Islamic era. From the Muslim perspective, it was no longer 622 A.D., or 622 years after the birth of Christ, but A.H. 1. They were commemorating the year Islam was born. They knew what you now know. The religion of Islam died in Mecca. A tyrannical and violent political doctrine took its place. The first Medina Surah abrogated most everything that had been proclaimed during Islam's fated religious period. This was a new day, Resurrection Day, the beginning of political Islam, the doctrine of submission. Some things didn't change, however. Muhammad's character remained the same, as did his charade of using godly pronouncements to defend his claims. But his behavior did change. So did his commandments. Circumstances enabled the failed prophet to act more belligerently. While the Meccans gained enemies, the Hanifs joined an ever-growing list of condemned, one that would soon include the members of rival religions, Christians and Jews. 
most of the religious rhetoric and pagan rituals borrowed by Muhammad from Qusay during his stay in Mecca continued unabated in Medina. Although God changed his name, and the revealing spirit, Satan, was now called Gabriel, Muhammad continued to rely on the Bible for inspiration. But rather than admonishing Meccans for the abomination of non-capitulation, Scripture became Muhammad's means to authorize abominations. The Quran became his favorite tool. Muhammad was about to prove that when it comes to repression, nothing succeeds like the mix of religiosity, money, and weapons. The events that were about to unfold in the Arabian desert would ultimately cost mankind more than could possibly be imagined. To body. The time for the Friday prayer overtook Muhammad while he was in the bed of a wadi, which is a dry riverbed. This place was used as a mosque that day. This was the first Friday prayer which the messenger held in Islam. The facts have been altered to fit the agenda. On arriving in Medina, the Prophet tried to hoodwink the Jews into joining his team by claiming that he observed their Sabbath, prayed towards their temple, and was one of their prophets. The initiation of the Friday prayer ritual into Islam came as the result of the Jews mocking Muhammad's bogus allegations. While factually inaccurate, the hadith remains an insightful depiction of the Muslim mindset. The Islam of the Prophet Muhammad, the Islam of terror, was first practiced in Medina. The isnad upon which this oral tradition is based does not include Abu Bakr, the only man with Muhammad at the time. So it is as suspect as it is revealing. To body, the sermon the messenger led at the first Friday prayer in the wadi outside Medina began, Praise be to Allah, I praise him, and I call on him for help, forgiveness, and guidance. I believe in him, do not deny him, and I am an enemy of whoever denies him. This established the tone and purpose of Islam. Anyone who didn't submit became an enemy. And for Muslims who claim that Muhammad was perfect, Christ-like, that doesn't mesh with asking for forgiveness. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah, without partner, and that Muhammad is his messenger, whom he sent with guidance after an interval in the appearance of messengers, at a time when knowledge is scarce, men are led astray, time is cut short, the last hour is at hand, and the end is near. It is amazing that Muhammad claimed that Allah had no partners, when the overwhelming theme of the Medina Surahs was the establishment of the partnership between Allah and his apostle. They not only shared everything, including booty from raids, they ultimately became equals, co-conspirators to be believed in, obeyed, and feared. You may recall that Muhammad predicted that the last hour, the end of the world, the dreaded day of doom, would follow the commencement of his union with Allah by 500 years, 1110 A.D. When Bukhari collected this hadith in 850 A.D., and when Tabari built it into his history in 900, it still loomed on the horizon, unfulfilled and thus inerrant. There was, however, some truth in the opening stanza of Muhammad's first sermon. Knowledge was scarce, especially when it came to his prognostications and revelations. In this vacuum, his ignorance was mistaken for divine inspiration. Whoever obeys Allah and his prophet has been rightly guided. Two words say it all, obey and and. The partnership has been formed between Allah and Muhammad and we have been put on notice that the stated purpose is to obey them. And since Allah never revealed himself apart from Muhammad, the and was redundant. Whoever disobeys them has erred, been remiss, and gone far astray. I recommend to you the fear of Allah, for the best thing which a Muslim can enjoin upon a Muslim is that he should be commanded to fear Allah. The Prophet has revealed the implement of submission. It is fear. Remember the Quran said, Quran 87.10, He who fears will obey. In ten sentences, Muhammad encourages fear ten times. From Muhammad to Hitler, 
from Stalin to Saddam, fear is how tyrants govern. Tabari, aware of what Allah has warned you concerning himself, the fear of Allah, for whoever acts according to it in fear and dread of his Lord, is a trusty aid to what you desire. It was clear why Muslims should fear God. Their boss was a demonic plotter, lurking in hell, dragging men he had deceived to their doom, tormenting them in his raging fire. Allah says, The sentence that comes from me cannot be changed, and I am in no wise a tyrant unto the slaves. The fear of Allah will ward off Allah's hatred, retribution, and wrath. In Islam, infidels have been predestined to a pronouncement of guilt. The hellish sentence comes from God, and it cannot be appealed. This diabolical thought is followed by... Allah has caused you to know his book, and opened his path before you in order that he may know those who speak the truth and those who lie. If the inverse of sense is nonsense, we have found it. Yahweh gave us the Bible so that we might recognize truth and detect liars. Allah gave us the Quran so that he might know the truth from deceit. Muhammad, standing in the sand of a wadi, admonished the sole member of his congregation, Abu Bakr. Be enemies of Allah's enemies, and strive in Allah's cause, which is jihad, in the way to which he is entitled. He has chosen you and named you Muslims. Arabic for one who submits. The notion that God has enemies remains essential to the growth of Islam, but it's the innocuous line... He has chosen you and named you Muslims. That is far more revealing. In Judeo-Christianity, men and women are given the opportunity to choose God. In Islam, it's the dark spirit who chooses. There is no power but with Allah. Allah pronounces judgment upon men, and because Allah rules men, they do not rule Him. The sword swung by Muslims must have been a mirage or Allah himself was wielding it. The last line of Muhammad's sermon makes no sense if Allah is God, yet it makes perfect sense if Muhammad is Allah, and if he wants to rule like God. Tabari, the messenger mounted his she-camel and let her reins hang loose. The inhabitants of every settlement of the Ansar, the Muslims of Medina called helpers, which she went past, invited him to stay with them, saying, Come, messenger, to a settlement which has many defenders. It is well provisioned and impregnable. Although not on the same scale, the Ansar, following the Karish lead, are tempting the prophet. Ishak, he would say to them, Let go of her reins, for she is commanded. Finally he reached the present site of his mosque, and his camel knelt down where the door of his mosque is, At that time the place was a drying floor for dates, and belonged to two orphan boys. He's in town five minutes, and he's conned a piece of land away from two orphans. The hypocrisy is so thick you can cut it with a scimitar. And did you notice that the first mosque was Mohammed's, not Allah's? And actually it would be more home, brothel, and politburo than mosque anyway. The messenger ordered that a mosque should be built there. It is said that Muhammad bought the site of this mosque and then built upon it. But the correct version, in our opinion, is this. The site of the mosque of the Prophet belonged to two orphans under Najjar's care. It contained palm trees, cultivated land, and pre-Islamic graves. The messenger said, Ask me a price for it. But they said, Our only reward shall be from Allah. Muhammad then gave orders concerning the site. The palm trees were cut down, the cultivated land leveled, and the graves were dug up. The preparation for the first Islamic mosque was not without rich symbolism. Islam remains unproductive, the world's most impoverished doctrine. It wantonly demolishes productive assets. It hypocritically cons the poor out of their only chance for a better life. And Islam was and continues to be built on the backs of dead infidels. Muhammad left Mecca penniless. He couldn't have bought the land any more than he could have financed the construction. Even his camel was a gift. But this was the new Muhammad. 
He knew what so many religious charlatans have come to know. Promise the people paradise, and they will give you the world. Thank you.